Welcome this, to this Brennan Center live program. Um, we are so delighted to have with us today our special guest, Martha Minow, who is the author of the recently published book, When Should Law Forgive? Um, before I start on the book, let me just say that the Brennan Center frequently sponsors talks and discussions like this on topical issues that are facing our democracy and present um, real questions of debate for our democracy and sustaining it. So we are really delighted to be able to have this conversation and many of the others. So if you take a look at the screen behind me, you can see some of the things that are coming up. And you can also follow us at www.brennancenter.org and on Twitter at Brennan Center. So you can get all of the latest there. So please feel free to do that, not during this program, but later on in your own spare time. But our guest today needs no introduction. She's truly a rock star in the law. Martha Minow is the 300th anniversary university professor at Harvard Law School. She's not 300 years old. She is not 300 years old, but she is the 300th anniversary university professor as well as the former dean of Harvard Law School where she has taught since 1981. She is an expert in human rights and a fierce advocate for members of racial and religious minorities and for women, children, and people with disabilities. Tonight, we celebrate the publication of her new book, When Should Law Forgive? I had the opportunity to read the book over the last week, and let me just say it is really a tour de force that prompts you to think seriously about the question of forgiveness, how forgiveness operates in our everyday lives, and whether the law should operationalize forgiveness and build it in to the administration of our justice system. In the book, she explores the various tools that law already uses to promote forgiveness in everyday life, um, including amnesties, pardons, bankruptcy, and she thinks seriously about how these initial efforts might be expanded so that forgiveness can be a regular part of law's repertoire. In the book, she outlines her ideas for reforming the criminal justice system and explains how it would function in practice. And she thinks about the broader philosophical questions of who has the power to forgive, who should be forgiven, and on what terms. So with that set up in mind, we have a rich discussion ahead of us. So please join me in welcoming Martha Minow. Thank you so much. So forgiveness has been in the news for the last week, right? So how many of you saw the aftermath of the trial of Amber Geiger um, in Texas? Yes. All right. So Amber Geiger was on trial for the murder of Botham Jean, who was an African-American man who he, she confronted in his own home. She mistakenly took his apartment for hers and shot him. He was unarmed at the time and he was killed. The trial was stunning in lots of dimensions, but perhaps what was most searing in the public imagination was the conclusion of the sentencing phase. Ms. Geiger was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but at the end, Botham Jean's brother came down from the stand and publicly hugged her and told her that he forgave her, that he loved her, and that he would be praying for her. And then subsequently, the judge who had presided over the, the trial also came down and hugged both the family and Amber Geiger herself. This was the hug heard around the world, right? So lots of people saw this, and it prompted a kind of polarized reaction. So on the one hand, there were those who saw this, I think rightly, as an incredible act of grace and forgiveness. But there were others who noted that this kind of forgiveness is frequently born by minorities, people in positions of, who are disempowered and who are often forced to bear the brunt of offering up their forgiveness um, when perhaps they shouldn't, right? So I think a broad question I have as I read the book and I'm thinking about this, is there a way in which the expectation of forgiveness is raced and gendered and in thinking about who we expect to forgive, do we impose a disproportionate burden on those who are already somewhat dispossessed in society? So it's such a central question, uh, and all of those com complex reactions to this particular moment capture some of the issues I wrestled with. There was a, a sense of grace when uh, this young man, 18 years old, 
clearly reflecting uh, issues that he had wrestled with in his life, saying, you, you are like me, I, you are a person. I mean, that generosity of spirit, I mean, how can you not be moved by it? Um, and at the same time, uh, isn't there something wrong with this picture? Here's this white police officer. How could she have mistaken someone else's house for her? I mean, the whole thing is just so hard to understand. Uh, one of the uh, uh, reactions I have to your comment is, of course, expectations of forgiveness are race and gendered. They're also about class. They're about power. But that's partly because forgiveness is one of the powers of the weak. To claim the ability to forgive, and let's be clear, to not forgive, is to claim the position of equality and dignity. Uh, and that's a power that we shouldn't actually ever take away from people. But it took me about eight years in working on this book to realize the book is not about whether the law should promote interpersonal forgiveness. In fact, it's mostly about the law should stay out of any kind of interpersonal activity. It, it should at best relieve people from consequences of actually apologizing. For example, there are 36 states that now have apology laws so that if someone in the medical profession, for example, after surgery that didn't work out apologizes, they don't actually then fear the introduction of that sentence into a civil action. I mean, we should have ordinary human interactions, but any use of the police power of the state to promote interpersonal forgiveness or apologies is a sham at best and is oppressive at worst. So I am not about that. On the other hand, we live in the most incarcerating society in the history of the planet. There has to be some way in which we can look at the tools inside of law and say, you know, there, this is time for a reset. Every major civilization has had a reset button if you go back to ancient Babylonia, you look at the Jubilee in the Bible, you look at actually civilizations whose names we don't even remember, they came up with these tools to restart the clock, to clear the slate when it came to criminal law or bankruptcy. I think we're in one of those moments right here, right now. So you're not advocating for interpersonal forgiveness and law dictating something like Botham Jean's brother coming down from the stand to forgive someone, but rather the state facilitating opportunities for us as a society to engage in a kind of collective means of forgiveness. Exactly, there. exactly. Although, again, Brent Jean's act, I think, was an act of grace, and it might inspire some people to think about their own lives, but the law should not have anything to do with that, and the judge, I think, was a little more problematic for the judge then, uh, at least it was after the sentencing was over, so the formal process was over, but that's not what the judge should be doing, certainly not handing out a Bible. Well, so handing out Bibles, hugging people. Um, I was reminded with the judge's actions of a case that occurred not too long ago in California, and that, of course, is the Brock Turner case at, on Stanford's campus. Um, the judge in that case, Aaron Persky, lost his seat in a, re, in a recall election. Um, and again, the idea was that in sentencing Brock Turner, he had been too lenient. Uh, there are a number of people who cried out that maybe the issue was about disproportionate leniency, but the issue shouldn't be leniency in the criminal justice system. That ought to be something to be promoted. So as part of this larger reform mm -hmm. effort to think about or rethink criminal justice and other parts of our law, um, what is the interaction between forgiveness and mercy? How are they related to each other? How are they distinct? Well, in that particular case, the judge actually said, this young white man has such a future ahead of him. And so the fact that that sentence was uttered there and is so often not uttered in contexts where the defendants don't look like him, that's what I think led to the outcry. And, you know, I'm not sure... If I were starting from scratch, I would support uh, elections and recalls of judges, but if you have it, this seems like a good use of it. Mercy is a, con is a concept that is about who the person who has power can decide not to use it. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is often the person who doesn't have power. And that seems to me, therefore, a bigger concept. It, it embraces more. When we talk, when I talk about forgiveness in the legal system, I mean something very specific. I mean 
actually foregoing sanction, punishment that is actually justified. It's not forgiveness unless it's justified. And in my view, unless there is a wrong and a wrong that's acknowledged and a wrong that's acknowledged by the wrongdoer and efforts to actually make amends, we shouldn't be talking about forgiveness. Well, if we are talking about forgiveness and all of those conditions are met, that there has been a wrong, it is a justifiable offense, shouldn't we be talking about justice and not necessarily forgiveness? So um, one of the challenges is, at least going back to Aristotle, we have an idea that justice is treating like cases alike. And whatever forgiveness is, it's not rule-bound. And so it, there's a tension between this rule orientation of the law on the one hand and forgiveness, a letting go of justified mm -hmm. uh, sanction. I worry about it. I worry about that discretion. But as was true of the judge in the Brock Turner case and it, any prosecutor, uh, how about the police officer that stops people to decide whether or not to give a ticket? There's discretion all over this legal system. And we don't have rules about how that discretion should be exercised. And we know that it's exercised in unfair ways. I guess what I'm calling for is a jurisprudence, a way to think about where there is discretion. Let's develop some norms. Let's at least be critical of it. You know, let's take the instance of pardons where presidents have the ability to pardon someone without asking anybody else. I think there can be a justification for the pardon, but in the United States, under the United States Constitution, we don't have any rules about when the pardon is given. And I think that we have some examples that are appalling. And so at a minimum, I think we, we may have more. <laughs> oh, oh, it's so horrible to think about. You can laugh <laughs> a little bit. But I do think that we would be better off if we now talked about it. Mm -hmm. And we said, OK, that's, not, that's an unpardonable pardon. Here's, here's an in instance when that, that, that power to let go of punishment is, should not be used. Right. So, okay, let's get down to brass tacks. The three specific examples that you use in the book are transitional justice, and particularly, particularly the example of child soldiers in Sierra Leone and other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa where there's been ethnic conflict. You also talk about bankruptcy and the forgiveness of debt. And then finally, there's the discussion of amnesty, pardons. Clemency would probably fall in there as well. Expungements, commutations, yes. Right. Are these, I, I assume you don't think that these are exhaustive, that there are other places. So where else, sorry, and, and sort of what does it look like to have a jurisprudence of forgiveness? Well, uh, so just I'll say something about these chapters since you were so nice to mention them. You know, what's the method of reasoning by lawyers? We don't really have a method except comparison. That's what we do. And so my method here is to take some examples that may not usually be put in juxtaposition, and to compare the treatment of child soldiers with the treatment of juvenile offenders in this country. Child soldiers, international law, humanitarian uh, discussions, human rights, are filled with concern about recognizing the ways in which the children, the young adults, even if they commit horrific acts, they are not entirely to blame. They were caught up in wars created by adults. We don't talk that way about juvenile offenders in this country. And I wanted to draw that comparison. A jurisprudence of forgiveness would say, let's take situations that look somewhat similar, let's treat them more comparably. Uh, and then, yeah, bankruptcy. You know, we use the word forgiveness to forgive a debt. It's, that's what the law is. It's right there in the law. I've had people say to me, forgiveness has nothing to do with the law. I said, well, then we better get rid of the bankruptcy law because it's right there. But in bankruptcy, we have this idea that corporations, for sure, and under some circumstances, individuals, should have an ability to have a fresh start. We don't do that with criminal law. We don't have a fresh start. Even people who have served their whole time, they come out, they have the stigma, and in states across this country, they're denied the vote, they're denied driver's licenses, they're denied housing, jobs, licenses, per professional licenses, sometimes even custody of their children. That seems wrong to, to me, and a jurisprudence of forgiveness would actually say, 
forgiveness means you can let go and have a clean slate. We don't do that right now in the criminal justice system. We should. And then, as I guess I've already started to hint, that when it comes to pardons and amnesties, I think that w while, yes, this is an act of discretion, we should have some criteria. And at least the public should be able to debate and discuss it, if not, as some countries do, actually have judicial review or commissions or more than one person, one person's whim. These are examples that are the explicit areas in the law where there already is forgiveness built in. I think there could be more, and certainly there already is in all the areas where there's discretion. But the discretion, again, is exercised usually away from any kind of visibility. You know, we have a recently elected progressive prosecutor in Boston who has announced that she's not going to use her power to go after low-level drug offenses. And it's, she says it's not a good use of our limited resources. She is getting excoriated. If she didn't announce it, she could just do it quietly. There's something wrong with that picture. We should be able to say explicitly, here's how we're using our discretion. This is what President Obama did with the Dreamers. He said, you know, oh, we have limited bandwidth in enforcing the immigration law. This is the group that <laughs> really, it's not a good use of our resources. They are caught up in a web of problems that's not theirs. And, you know, litigation's still going on on that one. Yes, we'll be hearing more about that as the year progresses. Um, with, with that in mind, um, if we can think of forgiveness as an opportunity to redirect resources, um, an opportunity to sort of displace where we would ordinarily shift law's attention to other places. Um, how do we reckon with some of the idiosyncratic characteristics of our own society? So when you raise the comparison between the child soldiers in Sierra Leone and the juvenile gang offenders here in the United States, or I think in Chicago is the example you use in the book, what explains the difference? For me, the first thing I thought of was the residue of race right. in the United States. So how much does our own baggage impede our ability as a society to be generous and forgiving? Well, it is the, not only the original sin, it's the ongoing sin in this country. So we can't discuss any of this subject without talking about race. That's absolutely right. And yes, reparations needs to be a conversation. But I actually think it's even more complex than that. And it may be it has something to do with the Puritan roots of this country. So the juvenile court as an institution was invented in the United States. 1899, Chicago, my hometown. The idea that young people should not be caught up in the same kind of criminal justice system as adults. And the original idea was they should instead have a chance to be educated and have social supports and have a new start. It was a fresh start idea. Somewhere between 1899 and 1965, that ideal disappeared. And the juvenile courts became at first chaotic, punitive, and ultimately over time, if anything, more punitive than the adult courts. Th that's not just about race. That's about, it, I'm surely it is about race, but you, you know, you can actually think about the ways in which older people look down at young people and say, these are hooligans and we should lock them up, or, you know, they're super predators, or s words about young people that obscure that they are human beings too. And I, there's some kind of a propulsion or dynamic inside the legal system that once it's in going, it gets more punitive and more punitive in this country. It's not true in other countries, but it is true in this country. So, so is it just simply like a kind of path dependency? Like once you fall into the path, it just accelerates and you become more inclined to pursue that route? Because I mean, I, I, the history of the juvenile defense system is, is you know, quite clearly rehabilitative in nature, supposedly. But I mean, also somewhat imperialistic too. I mean, it was originally cast as a way to discipline the children of young immigrants whose parents couldn't get it together to assimilate properly, like to sort of literally function in loco parentis to reshape these children and their outcomes. Um, if, that's, if that's the original blueprint, can we expect something more? I mean, it's just that 
the individuals who are wrapped up in it have changed complexion, but our antipathy for them hasn't really changed. Well, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe you're right. I mean, it, the problem is we can't run an experiment and see what happens if we start over and do it differently. Uh, and yes, the legal system is disciplining difference. That's a lot of what's going on. But at least for the first 20, 30 years of the juvenile court's uh, history, not just in Chicago, but around the country, settlement houses emerged. Mm -hmm. And alternatives to the formal legal system, places, after schools, these are after school programs. Mm -hmm. And it was a vision that was quite, quite different. We could have gone a different road. Which brings up what we use now to make up. So those sorts of after school programs, those kind of state sponsored programs were part of a larger social safety net that we no longer have now. And you are a well-known professor of family law. We usually expect the family to do that kind of work. Can we have a jurisprudence of forgiveness if we have a state that we are basically consigned to have play a passive role in the lives of citizens? Like we have basically accepted a social welfare state that is in tatters. Can we have forgiveness without serious state investment in people? I think that to seriously talk about forgiveness is to understand that we're implicated in each other's lives and that each of us is part of concentric circles of causation. And to actually have the ability to forgive is to have enough privilege that you have some power even if everything else in your life is limited. I think that the bankruptcy system acknowledges that actually this is a problem not just between, between one debtor and one, uh, uh, one creditor. We need to understand there's a whole network here and we need to come up with feedback loops and ways to adjust the market for debt. I think that's certainly true about crime as well. Who ends up being in a situation where it looks better to participate in crime as opposed to other kinds of activities? You know, you are a distinguished uh, scholar of family law. We know the standard used in courts for children is the best interest of the child. It's one of the most bizarre phrases in history because any child who stands up in court has already lost their best interests. It is way too late for that. So how do we keep people out of court? That's definitely, it requires social investment. We not only have a limited state when it comes to that, we have a view that actually other people's children are not our business. And we have a view that uh, ours is a negative constitution. It's only protection against the government. It's not protection for anything. And it's an antiquated constitution when you compare it with others around the world. And I think that, yes, a lot of the problems that have led to over-incarceration reflect the failure of the rest of the society, the rest of other kinds of social investment. You know, I do a lot of work with uh, uh, people with disabilities, and for children with disabilities in many parts of the country, the only way to get services for somebody is for them to get caught up in the juvenile justice system, which is a terrible thing for any child, but enabled to be able to order services. It's a problem. This is a serious problem, yes. So this relates to um, your last point about just our lives being inextricably bound to each other. We, have, we share a common fate, whether we recognize it or not. There was this really terrific op-ed in the New York Times yesterday about um, a fight over a library in Arkansas. Did anyone read this? No, thank you. Thank you for reading newspapers. <laughs> Uh, the New York Times, thanks you. You had a great op-ed recently in the New York I, Times. I had an okay op-ed. This was actually a terrific op-ed. Um, it recounted the story of uh, a, just a conflict in a small town in Arkansas over this library that was built during very flush times when there was lots of extraction of natural gas in the area and people were relatively flush. They built a really sparkling new library and now the issue was they had fallen on hard times, they could only have one librarian, but she was doing twice the work of one librarian, and she wanted to get paid maybe $10,000 more, so now she would be making a salary of $42,000, and the town absolutely balked, right? And they talked about this in incredibly politically polarized terms, like people needed to sort of circle the wagons and deal with their own problems. This was not a sort of sharing economy. This was not about investing in public goods. Instead, 
we, we didn't need these kinds of services, libraries and things of that nature. We needed to sort of focus on basic needs and everyone had to take care of themselves. How can we have a culture or a jurisprudence of forgiveness if we, at bottom, have a kind of polarized politics that emphasizes this kind of survival of the fittest, every man for him or herself? We're living in a time of walled communities and a time of privatization. The phrase public good, the phrase public interest, the phrase public has become tarnished in America. And yes, uh, I think that that's a reflection of the same sentiments of resentment that you know is the reason that I wrote the book. I think we're living in an age of resentment. I think we're living in a time when people actually project onto others what's difficult in their own lives. Getting at all the roots of that and undoing it, it's a big project. I don't know if I'm up to that, but I do know this. Forgiveness is a human resource for letting go even of justified resentment. And we should amplify it, we should develop it, we should make it stronger uh, interpersonally, but I'm suggesting institutionally as well. Um, to have that restart, to be able to say, okay, yeah, life is hard for me, but you know, I can let that go and we can start over. That the situation of the library is a, you know, a, a really striking example. Libraries are really, in many communities, the last public space, the last place that people can go and just for free and sit. You know, there are communities all over this country where you can't just sit. In Hawaii, you can't just sit. You're picked up for sitting. I talked to the Chief Justice of Hawaii about this recently. I mean, this is a problem that, yes, stems from a kind of resentment and a privatization of what had been our shared world. A shared world. So if we think about that idea of a shared world, how we can create it, and what it requires of us to be able to move forward together and get to this point where we can be forgiving and accept forgiveness. At some point, um, you know, we've been skating around the role of the state. How do we factor in whether or not the state, in as much as individuals are, is an entity that has transgressed and we must forgive? I mean, we can think of so many different things in our history, um, internment, slavery. We can't even have a conversation about reparations in this country. I mean, my op-ed made that really clear. We, we could have a conversation about it, but we won't. And instead, we talk about diversity and the idea of a sort of benign and tolerable pluralism. But what we really want and should talk about is how do we get past the serious injuries that the state itself has done? So how do we have those conversations, and are those conversations necessary to be a culture that forgives and that can create and construct a jurisprudence of forgiveness? When Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson, Missouri, it took the investigation by the Department of Justice to expose the ways in which the criminal justice system in his community was funded on fees imposed on the backs of the poorest people in the community. People didn't know. And people didn't know in part because there's no local news in Ferguson, Missouri. There's no newspaper, there's no cable TV. But people didn't know in part because, in fact, they took it as just normal that there are poor people and they're gonna have to pay for their own parole officer and their own probation and they're gonna have to pay the fines and fees that then lead them to be incarcerated again. The flaws, it's such an understatement to say the flaws of our legal system, the legal system itself that's producing debtor's prison, which was outlawed by the Supreme Court of the United States nearly 100 years ago. So when the uh, publisher wonderfully came up with this cover from my book, the pillars on the cover were pristine and beautiful. And I said, we can't have them be pristine or beautiful because that implies the law is fine and the law itself is broken. So if you look closely now, you'll see some crumbly parts on the, on the pillars. Um, I think that the uh, acknowledgement of the mistakes and the errors in the legal system is the beginning of a jurisprudence of forgiveness because only if there's an acknowledgement of these as mistakes can you have correction. 
So we can't even start talking about this until we do that. So this is a book that we have to put away until we have a new administration, is that the point? Well, uh, I was writing this book for a while and then there was an election. <laughs> and when the election happened, I thought, oh, I'm gonna need a chapter on what's not forgivable. Um, and th that's very much what the amnesty pardon chapter is. But I actually do think that we will not have a different kind of country until there's more forgiveness. So on, I, I assume that like many of you, like, like me, many of you are fans of Harry Potter, yes? yes. There are three unforgivable curses, Absolutely. right? Avada Kavadra, the Cruciatus Curse, the Imperius Curse. If you don't know that, you cannot call yourself a Harry Potter. I had a research assistant go through all of the Harry Potter books and find every instance of the use of the word forgiveness. It is all over the books. Well, they have a jurisprudence of forgiveness in the magical world. <laughs> um, the muggle world apparently does not. Um, what, what sorts of transgressions are completely unforgivable? There's just no coming back from it. I do think that um, actually Sheriff Arpaio's conduct is unforgivable. And the fact that he was pardoned by the President of the United States is also unforgivable. Sheriff Arpaio was found to have violated the civil rights of hundreds of people by uh, jailing them, housing them in open sunlight in Arizona, above 110 degrees, dressing them in humiliating clothes, physically assaulting them. He was found to have violated their civil rights. And then he was found in contempt of court for continuing to violate their civil rights, and he was pardoned for that. Not only is this unacceptable because it signals that President Trump is willing to give a pardon to someone who supported his campaign, and that President Trump is signaling to anyone else who supports him, I can pardon you too. It's thumbing his nose at the rule of law. It's actually saying those violations of the decency, the minimum decency of people's human rights, that's okay. So that's unforgivable in my mind. Anything else? <laughs> I have a long list. I drive in Boston. I mean, I have a long <laughs> list of un unforgivable. Left hand turns. <laughs> I know that many of you have questions in the audience and I wanna make sure we have enough time to accommodate your interests as well. So if you have questions, there'll be people floating around with microphones. You can queue up at these two microphone posts. So if you can just come to the post right here. Let me just say you. one more thing. You know, in the context of debt, I think it's not just John Oliver, but it's the Pope, it's Bono. People finding that you can buy people's debt for pennies on the dollar and forgive it. And when you do, you transform their lives. But John Oliver paid like $60,000 for millions of dollars. Millions of dollars of, of consumer debt and medical debt. Yeah. Right. Okay, we have quite a long queue already forming. Um, please make sure your question is crisp and truly a question. So no statements with rising intonation at the end. Okay. I'll do my best. Okay. Um, Professor who, who are you, could you say? Uh, Rick Fuad. Um, I teach professional responsibility and I'm an attorney. Um, so, everything that you said, thank you for coming, first of all, and uh, speaking on this. So, um, everything that you said really resonates, and when I look at the criminal justice system, uh, the thing that strikes me is that we have a conversation that is absurd. When we have our um, top jurists talking about which drugs we're going to use to kill someone, I, I'm aghast. And in Europe, that would be recognized is so utterly savage and barbaric that it's beneath us to even discuss. The difference being that the society looks at it differently. And so my question is, what can we do to raise the level of education and consciousness in our country where our better angels are actually unleashed and people start to realize that even a murderer is a human being and people can be redeemed and the idea that we, we don't, we've sort of tossed that out the window and the, the Sheriff Arpaios, or however you pronounce his name, they are in power because they pander to a mob that thrives on that and, and we don't have to be that way. Why, is our, why aren't we educating people better to you know, recognize more 
of the humanity around us and build this culture of, of restorative justice and redemption. Well, Brian Stevenson, professor at this great institution and author of the brilliant book, Just Mercy, he says nobody is, should be judged by their worst moment. And I agree with that, and I think that not enough people think about that. I think that we need a legal system that thinks about that, that the, no one is summarized by their worst moment. Not even Joe Arpaio? Well, that wasn't just his worst moment. <laughs> so you can only have one. <laughs> I don't know all of his life, but there are you know, decades and decades of this yeah. conduct. Um, I think that the comparison with other countries is very striking. We, we can't just wave a magic wand and be a different culture and be a different society. But I do think that there are many, many people in this country who think there's something off the rails. And I also think that education is the place to start. It's the, the resource that I have devoted my life to. Uh, do you know that this is the 50th anniversary of Sesame Street? Pretty cool, right? And Sesame Street um, you know, had the idea that every child, regardless of where they live, should be able to you know, learn their numbers and learn their letters uh, early on, but also learn that you know, everyone is their neighbor, and also, over time, learn that you can control your emotions. I, I have proposed, not yet success, but why don't you write in and tell them, they should have a Sesame Street about law. And it should be about what it is to have the mutual respect that's necessary for a legal system. So that's my idea. Great question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Clara. I'm hoping to go to law school with a focus in restorative justice. Um, so I grew up with a federal defense attorney as a father. He works in the Philadelphia Capital Habeas Unit. And um, some of the largest miscarriages of justice that I've seen throughout my life, specifically through the lens of his work, have ended in Alfred pleas. And I wanted to hear your opinion on those and the way that they're used in our system right now. So I am not myself a, a prosecutor or a defense attorney, and Alfred pleas are a technical uh, device that uh, can actually allow for a lifting of some kind of the consequences. But I want to pick up on your use of the phrase restorative justice because that to me is a much bigger and more promising avenue. And do you know that the District of Columbia now has decided to send all of its juvenile justice cases to restorative justice? Restorative justice being the idea that you can actually create a setting where the person who's accused and the person who's a victim can sit together with other people in the community and talk directly, face to face, about this is what this meant to me, and this is where it came from, and who else could participate, and now let's talk about the future, and what can we plan that will make this better for everybody in the future. It seems like a really good approach to me, and it's actually gaining traction in high schools in America, too. So I think that this is a promising avenue, more so than a plea in the middle of the otherwise existing adversarial system. Uh, hi, my name is Leslie Goldstein. I'm a retired political scientist. My question is about some of the things you said and how you see them as fitting together. You started by telling us that um, two examples of forgiveness in the legal system are amnesty and bankruptcy law. And you also said that in your understanding of forgiveness, or let's say appropriate forgiveness, the perpetrator of, of a wrong needs to recognize that what he or she did was wrong feel express sorrow or regret about it uh, as a preliminary to getting forgiveness. Um, but I don't see that happening in bankruptcy, and I don't see it in, w for me, the most momentous amnesty of recent decades was the amnesty of undocumented immigrants, I think, in the 80s. Um, and People talk about doing it again because we have so many millions who need some settlement of their legal situation. But again, I don't think undocumented immigrants regret that they came to the United States or that we should expect them to express regret. So how do you see those things as fitting together? So 
thank you for that very thoughtful question. You know, I, I don't think the legal system should be in the business of demanding performances of particular emotions. So if I said that people are supposed to express regret, it's not what I meant. Okay. I, uh, what I do believe is that people should acknowledge that they did something wrong. They broke a law, even if they think the law is wrong. And we can't talk about forgiveness unless we start with, yeah, there was a wrong done. If you don't think there was a wrong done, then we're talking about defenses or justifications or something that's not about forgiveness. Uh, and there are many cases where there can be defenses or justifications, self-defense. I'm not, I didn't do something wrong, I was defending myself. In these instances, uh, actually the uh, arguments for amnesty for uh, undocumented immigrants now or uh, Ronald Reagan's amnesty, they broke the law. I mean, that's where we start. So then the question is, what do we do about it? And I think that there are many circumstances where what do we do about it? It starts with who's the we? And why are there so many immigrants here and why are they being punished? In part because some in the, in the 80s, many of them were induced to come here to work in the fields. And maybe we need a political settlement that actually doesn't put all the blame on them. Uh, and that uh, is very much the idea in bankruptcy. The idea of bankruptcy is that yes, somebody made a promise to pay and they didn't pay. But how did we get here? Well, during the mortgage disaster, the foreclosure disaster, we got here because there were people being actually given incentives to give mortgages to people who everyone knew couldn't pay. So the responsibility is partly theirs, but it's also partly those who actually induce them to take on those mortgages, and it's partly the larger financial system. And what bankruptcy does as a structure borrowing from the equity courts of the royal kings is to say, okay, let's put all of the pieces together and no, the creditors are not going to get paid 100%. They're not even going to get paid most of it. But yeah, there'll be consequences for the debtor too, like a low credit rating for the time going forward. So that's what I mean about, yeah, there was wrong done, but now what do we do? So some acceptance of negative consequences like paying a fine Absolutely. if you're uh, That's right. undocumented and so on. Yeah. Okay, that helps. Thanks. Uh, I actually took Leslie's question to be getting at something different. So m maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, Leslie. But I actually took the question, especially around the context of immigration, is that is there an obligation for the state, if you are cultivating a culture and a jurisprudence of forgiveness, to actually take affirmative steps in the law to make the country more forgiving and accommodating? of those who might seek refuge so that it isn't a crime to come here with, do, do you see what I'm I, saying? I do, but then I think we're not talking about forgiveness. We're talking about, you know, what was the Statue of Liberty about? What is asylum? <laughs> so, so that's like, that's not part of not a, a jurisprudence of forgiveness. No. So not about any sort of affirmative obligation. But, but, but that's a separate, separate kind of commitment that I would share. Mm -hmm. But it's not about forgiveness because it's saying maybe they didn't do anything wrong. We should be a country that welcomes anybody who's fleeing oppression in their country. I think that's what has made this country strong historically. I would like that to come back. You've gone beyond me, so I'm gonna sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the question. Hello, yes, my name is Christopher Vicciolo. I'm an active member of Black Lives Matter in New York City. And I feel that Amber Geyer should not be forgiven. She received a very minimum sentence. If an African-American had shot a police officer, they would be getting 25 years to life in prison. Do you feel that Amber Geyer should have gotten a much higher sentence to prison? So I think you raise uh, a really powerful and important point. As I said before, I don't really understand even how she didn't understand it was not her apartment. I mean, I don't understand anything going on in this case. Um, so I'm just not even there yet. Uh, uh, so I guess if there's uh, fact finders and that's what they concluded, they had discretion about the range of the sentence. We've had an experience in this country of trying to have flat mandatory sentences. It did not work. Um, and so I think we're struggling in this country. What do we do with the fact that now there's discretion about sentencing? Uh, but those kinds of disparities that some people get one sentence and others don't, and it has something to do with how they look or what job they have, that's an indictment of the system. Thank you. 
Hi, Dean Minow. Uh, my name is Nicandro. I'm a 3L at Columbia, actually. Thank you for having me, everybody. Um, <laughs> You'll be ushered out as soon as this <laughs> question is over. Um, I'm also hoping to be a public defender upon graduation, and your comments about Joe Arpaio um, got me wondering in your jurisprudence of forgiveness, do you have a five, six factor balancing test for what is unforgivable? And more generally, how do we think about like the spectrum of forgiveness? So how, how, how did you so clearly come to categorize him, uh, which I certainly I, I understand the, the, the temptation to do that or the desire to, or the feeling of that, but how can we coherently think about what is unforgivable or what deserves more forgiveness? Columbia is unforgivable. <laughs> Not my view, but um, <laughs> at least in the area of pardons, it, I do not, I have two, not factors, but two categories where it seems to me we ought to be developing a jurisprudence of forgiveness. One is corruption. The pardon should not be given in exchange for something that benefits the one giving the pardon, whether it's a campaign contribution or some other personal benefit, money, for example. Mark Rich, pardoned by President Clinton. Last day of his presidency, Mark Rich, who had given money to the Clintons, he'd given furniture to the Clintons. This is corruption. That should not be used. And the second is where the grant of the pardon induces law-breaking of laws that should not be broken, which is, again, Sheriff Arpaio. But I contrast that situation with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who broke laws, who was held in contempt. Case went up to the United States Supreme Court. Supreme Court reaffirmed the contempt citation. Even though the law that he disobeyed was a law that forbade peaceful marching and a court order given ex parte in the absence of actually uh, adversarial argument uh, in the middle of the night in a system that would never have given any equal rights to Dr. King or the people marching with him. Very different for him to disobey the law than for Arpaio to disobey the law. So that's the kind of jurisprudence that I'm trying to articulate. You know, is it the same set of factors in other areas? Probably not. You know, again, bankruptcy might be very different kinds of issues. Are there certain kinds of debts that shouldn't be eligible for bankruptcy? I do think so, but I don't think student loans are on that list. And it is only because of the political power of certain industries that student loans are now exempted from the bankruptcy laws. Even though, I just have to get this in, even though people who took out their student loans to go to a for-profit school that has since folded and declared bankruptcy, even they can declare bankruptcy, but the students can't. I mean, that's, there's something wrong here. And we compare, and when we compare and we see inequities, that's injustice. I think that there are other kinds of conduct that may be unforgivable. You know, I think genocide is unforgivable. Um, I do have that view. Um, it's interesting to me that the very first uh, conviction by the International Criminal Court of Thomas Labanga was for recruiting child soldiers. I think that's unforgivable to take away people's childhood and make them killers. That's unforgivable. But, you know, we could be here all night developing the list of ones unforgivable. I think what we need much more work on is developing a practice of what is forgivable. And that includes learning how to apologize interpersonally, which we don't really know how to do. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> starting. Um, thank you. Um, Melissa, we have another question. We have another question. Oh, Rebecca. Is that okay? Okay. Um, um, so forgiveness is on my mind both here and I guess personally, um, the Jewish observance of Yom Kippur begins tomorrow night. Um, and I'm, I'm Jewish, thinking, I've been thinking about it. <laughs> I've been thinking about like the opening service in which we ask to be forgived for vows, not that we broke in the past year, but ones that we are going to break in the year ahead. And that we ask to be forgiven and to be able to participate in a community effectively of sinners, of people who will break promises and break vows. And so without making like a sort of facile analog, I wonder if like to what extent we can foster a culture of forgiveness or even a jurisprudence of 
forgiveness within the American legal system by thinking of ourselves or like as you know, transgressing or committing crimes as not something that is extraordinary, but something that like we will each do and that is sort of the norm and how we create community because of that. Well, I think that's quite beautiful and I will think about that when I'm sitting in services <laughs> and fasting on Wednesday. Um, I do think that recognizing our own fallibility is really central to understanding the power of forgiveness. We each make mistakes, we will make mistakes, we have made mistakes. It's interesting, again, that every civilization has come up with forgiveness. Every religion, every religion, every philosophy, they have different norms about it. Some actually require um, that people take certain steps to repair the harm. Others actually celebrate the unilateral forgiveness. So there are different variations about it. But you know that studies of large apes show that actually large apes, after they fight, they engage in rituals of kind of reconciliation? I mean, there seems to be something that we need to do to recognize that we, are, we, are, we make mistakes, we get into messes. Um, and I think we need to cultivate that rather than to sit behind our own, you know, in our separate chairs and say, well, what you did was wrong. And I do think having community helps. Um, and I think actually being part of a community that, that sees we have all made mistakes, um, we can do something better. You know, I, I, I've been a dean, I'm a, I'm a professor, I'm dealing right now, as many people are, with the issue of microaggressions. And, you know, I've gotten criticized because I call people out for microaggressions. I've, I've also gotten criticized for not doing enough. What I think would be helpful would be everybody say, hey, this is really hard. And I'm not going to condemn you for the rest of your life because you said something that I find offensive. But you should know it's offensive and not do it again. And, and can we come up with a way to have those conversations? I think that would be helpful too. So with that, oh, there's another question over here. Oh, no? Yeah, yes? Hi, hello. Um, I'm Tori. I'm a freshman at NYU. Um, I have an interest in educational reform and specifically in racial justice as well. So my question is, so how do we, I wrote it down just in case I forgot. Um, how do we create just punishment without continually feeding into the criminal justice system? Like how do we find that balance between punishing people for their wrongdoing without, you know, perpetuating the system that has, you know, oppressed so many people? Are you thinking particularly about punishment in the school context? Um, no, no, just generally. Like criminal justice, whatever. Generally, yeah. generally. Generally, yeah. You know, it, it, one of the most um, self-defeating uh, uh, aspects of the legal system that I've seen is the communities that actually incarcerate people who haven't paid child support. Mm. What could be more self-defeating? Mm. The people who haven't paid child support often because they don't have the money, so now you're not gonna prevent their ability to raise the money. I mean, mm. but that's just a window onto, I think, many self-defeating aspects of the criminal justice system. One way to maybe make a turn is to, you know, come up with a plan. How is somebody going to actually pay their debt um, but, and acknowledge they did something wrong? And yes, have some curb on their liberty, maybe. Um, I don't know. But it would be just a different conversation than the conversation we have right now. Um, I do think that's the kind of conversation that restorative justice invites. And I th I'm, I'm very uh, encouraged to see parts of the country where there are experiments. And in some parts of the country, it's organized by prosecutors to have restorative justice. Mm -hmm. I mean, people in Texas from across the political spectrum are co collaborating in criminal justice reform because it is broken. It is not working. And whether they're coming to it uh, as evangelical Christians or as fiscal conservatives, it's not working. And I think that, therefore, there's an openness for some of these alternatives that uh, I haven't seen in decades. And having them be community generated, that's a big part of the restorative justice circle. Thank you. One, one, one last question? Yes, I was just wondering, I'm a family defense attorney, and I was wondering your thoughts on forgiveness in the child welfare system. It seems like in my experience, it's in very short supply. I think sort of in the 
<coughs> under the guise that because children are involved, we don't have the ability to forgive or, you know, with their best interests are at heart. And I was just curious to know what your thoughts were about how to bring forgiveness into the child welfare system or mercy in the child welfare system or just ending how it exists right now. Oh, boy, you and I need a longer conversation. Um, you know, it, it so much depends. If there's a child who's been brutalized, a child who's been battered, safety first. I, I, I just, for me, that's, uh, that's where you, you gotta go. If it means actually supervised visitation, we can explore that, but if that's something that's good for the adult but not for the kid, I'm not for it. So, um, but uh, having said that, look, we have uh, punitive elements of the child welfare system uh, really in the neglect context that are just beyond imagination. Uh, blaming somebody because, you know, they weren't in the house when they had to go out and do something and left the kid alone. Uh, so there are lots and lots of areas where, yes, we could use a re an overhaul of the criminal justice system. But, you know, I guess I think about the issue of violence in the home, whether it's children or it's even adults on adults, uh, as, as a, a context where safety first has to be uh, the way that we proceed. Because, again, if you're dealing with, um, you know, a, a spouse who's been battered, very often the tendency is to forgive. You know, she'll forgive him, and then there'll be another round of battery. And until there's a restart of a different nature, I guess I don't think that's a moment for forgiveness. Final question, um, and this builds on something that Rebecca said. One of, I think part of the appeal of forgiveness is that at least in our culture, it is somewhat extraordinary and exceptional. Does it dilute that appeal and that attractiveness if we are actively cultivating a culture where it is more common and forgiveness is proliferating? It's an interesting question. You think it, it is, we're so moved because it's so unusual? I don't know. I think that um, you start to listen for it and you listen in, in lyrics you know, of music. Harry and Potter. Harry Potter, uh, movies, great works of literature. Uh, it is actually all over our, our cultural materials but and not in honoring. Law, but not necessarily. But not in law, but not in law. So I don't think what makes forgiveness so moving is that it's unusual. I think it is that we see that it is actually summoning up the best that human beings can be. Uh, and we should actually open up the legal system to the best that human beings can be. All right, so onward toward a more forgiving culture. Um, Thank you so much for coming out to hear this talk tonight. Thank you to Martha Minow for sharing this Melissa, great work. Thank you. Thank you for being here. <laughs>